Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by BitMEX Spot, the brand new spot exchange from BitMEX. You've probably heard of BitMEX, one of the oldest large Bitcoin companies who played a leading role in helping Bitcoin emerge victorious from the hard fork wars of 2017. Their derivatives trading platform has stood the test of time and set the standard for reliability and performance for Bitcoin companies. BitMEX is now bringing that reliability to its spot exchange, and it is celebrating the launch of BitMEX Spot with a total of $1 million in prizes and a first prize of half a million dollars. Sign up on bitmex.com slash to begin buying Bitcoin and get a chance of winning. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. Question really to you is, you've used so many chapters, you've looked into so many areas. Did you have them all in mind when you started the book? You could just write them down, all of these, or did you even discover new new areas, new areas of, of really severe impact? We, you're not looking for, for things with a slight and light impact. Yeah. Oh, it could be a bit better if these are all huge impacts in on each of the things you, you outline. Yeah? As I said, really, you, you start reading this thing, Oh, come yet another thing, and and then you see. Well, it's it really has a huge impact on on every aspect of our lives. Yeah, from 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 our family life, from our health and long term wealth, and how whether we have a chance to to proceed in life to get to the next level. Maybe yeah, no matter where we are born. No matter what, where, where we started, that we at least with, with a with a good monetary system, we have the chance really to to get ahead and all make a living. Yeah, which would be great for for everyone else because if we see how much globalization could could uh, make us all wealthier, if we had more monetary system that everyone can use, and we just exchange value in that system, that would be. If, would not only help the poor people in in Africa; it would help us as well. We'd have such a big market, and and so much friction would be lost. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree entirely. I think um, I I would say this. I think I these are ideas that I had in mind from my days in gold before I'd even heard about Bitcoin. Before Bitcoin was around, I was familiar with the kind of the hard money critique of uh, fiat society from gold bugs, you know, from reading uh, Austrian economists, uh, Rothbard Mises, but also somebody like uh, more recent, like uh, uh, George Guido Holzman. He's lived more recently, so he's in a sense more uh, in tune with the phenomena that we see around us than uh, Mises, who was alive a long time ago. So uh, that really lays the foundation for seeing how fiat brings in the rot everywhere. Like you can see how fiat is the bad apple in the box that's eventually going to rot the boxes. So um, like, yeah, there are all these boxes of apples and you're putting a rotten one in each box. So it's just a question of going in there and uncovering which one was the rotten one and then how it spread to the rest of them. So 
Well, actually, in my case, initially it was in biofuels. That's that, that's the first fiat thing that I came across when I did that in my PhD. And it was something, you know, I didn't have any kind of interest in um, financially or emotionally you know, or in any kind of serious way. Um, did some, it didn't matter to me. You know, I was doing my PhD. And if I come up with the answer that biofuels are good, then great. If not, then that's fine. I, I wasn't emotionally or financially invested in the question. But then I just saw how... Uh, how completely insane the entire thing is just because you have this fiat money coming in from the top that distorts the ability of the world to function rationally and distorts the ability of people to allocate their capital rationally. And so because of that, we'd had 35 years of um, subsidies for uh, these ethanol producers and they still couldn't make it economical and they still couldn't get people to buy it unless they had the government force people to buy it. So you see it that way, and then you you know <laughs> you just start. If you just have that same kind of framework, wherein fiat ruins things because it's fake money that's being inserted into this, and government intervenes and then prevents the market from working, then you just apply that framework anywhere else, and you very quickly can uncover um, how the, that thing this functions. I mean, well, not very quickly, but I mean, um, you can you can get it far faster than if you were approaching each of these topics without that framework. This is how I would put it. So, for instance, you see, for instance, sometimes that there are investigative journalists that are looking into corruption in pharmaceutical companies, and they manage to uncover some ex- extremely damning evidence. But for them, you know, they need to really go w- without this framework of fiat where they, if they come at the problem thinking that pharmaceutical companies, there's nothing wrong with the idea of pharmaceutical companies, the way that they're structured, the way that the fiat medical system is structured is all fine. Um, But there's this whistleblower who's saying that they're doing something wrong and I'm going to talk to him and you're going to interview people and you're going to see leaked documents and you're going to spend years digging into it and then you're going to be able to figure out, oh wow, these people are just using and abusing their uh, position in order to sell things. Um, and this is why this thing is corrupt. But if you had seen this kind of fiat framework before, then you just look at this and you immediately know, all right, this is, uh, you know, clearly this is what's going on. And they're being supported by low interest rate credit and subsidies and uh, monopoly licenses from the government. And of course, they're abusing that. And of course, this is being run to their interest at the expense of the others. So it's just, it, it allows you to see the conclusion that others uh, need to get at with a lot of evidence and which is usually very shocking and jarring. You know, are you trying to tell me that this big giant corporation that we trust to inject things into our bodies and into our children is not just focused on the well-being of our children? That's, that's kind of uh, how you see it. So, to go all of this, go back to your question, and that when I first wanted to write the book, I had even more issues that I wanted to write about. There was a fiat medicine chapter. There was also a fiat chemistry chapter, wherein um, I wanted to just discuss the absurdity of the idea that we think government can regulate the periodic table and the natural substances on earth. And some things you know, you get thrown in jail if you take them. Other things, you, but 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 in certain contexts, that same thing, you know, you, if you're a 35-year-old adult and you take it on a weekend with your friends, you could have your life ruined and get thrown in jail. But then in another context, that same chemical can be given to a 12-year-old child because they are unable to sit through their extremely boring school propaganda classes. So then they need that medication. So, and then you've got this um, criminalization of all these natural occurring uh, substances that people use for recreation, but you have this enormous subsidization of all these artificial compounds, which can be patented and therefore can be highly profitable. So that's basically why we have this insane pharmaceutical industry and why we have the war on drugs. It's just the, the idea that government gets to decide what everybody needs to put into their bodies, which is insane because, I mean, we live in this world. We have nature around us. All of these things that occur around us, you know, they grow. These plants grow. So the notion that a plant could grow on your backyard, a weed could grow on your backyard without you even knowing about it just because a seed got thrown by somebody 
and that you could be held liable legally for the fact that this natural plant grew in your backyard is kind of insane. The result is, you know, you have pharmaceutical companies making billions and billions of dollars by selling extremely harmful compounds. On the other hand, uh, somebody like Ross Ulbricht, who's basically just facilitated the ability of consenting adults to buy things from one another, and it's just all chemical compounds, <laughs> and it's arguably far, far less harmful than the kind of things that pharmaceutical companies sell. And that becomes such a, an, an enormous crime. So there, that was a chapter. Then there was the medical uh, fiat medicine chapter, which is since, just like with the fiat diet, you know, there was the American Dietetics Association and then the dietary guidelines. And similarly with medicine, there's the American Medical Association and there are all the medical guidelines for what to do. And as a doctor, you know, you go to medical school and you get told if you get a patient who shows those symptoms, that means that you have this diagnosis and the standard of care is you put them on this pill. And so you have to do that. And if you don't do that, you could get into trouble. You could go to court, you could go to jail for not following the standard of care. So that's all fiat. And that all came about exactly at around the same time that fiat money came about because it was all financed by fiat money. So um, what happened specifically in the case of medicine is that it was Rockefeller and all of these uh, billionaires, or well, they weren't billionaires at that time, but all these very rich uh, people at that time who started all these foundations to invest in charitable causes. Um, that was around the same time that petroleum products came about, and they found the ability to start manufacturing drugs that produce the exact desired effect in a very precise way which you couldn't really do with natural compounds in the same way. You know, once you had modern industrialization, you had the Rockefeller uh, oil empire starting to use modern machinery in order to take chemical compounds and produce them in reliable ways and to use uh, petrochemicals in the production of those medicines. Once you got to that, you had just an enormous potential for the medical industry to solve a lot of health problems at that time. So... What they did was effectively they applied the engineering framework of what the Rockefellers did for energy and thought, we'll just do that for the human body. We'll just do that for um, diseases. There's a, it's, it's, it's a very long story. And this is, again, why I couldn't fit it into the book because, like, the, yeah, you could write 10 books about this. And, like, researching it and putting it into a chapter and summarizing it is um, not very easy. You know, taking down a century of fiat medicine in one chapter and then moving on to <laughs> universities and then moving on to nutrition and then moving on to climate change is a bit much. There'll be more books. We'll, we'll fit these into future ones. But um, there was something called the Flexner Report. You might want to look into it. And so these guys financed this person to modernize uh, medicine in America. And he did a report for these foundations. And then they decided what we need to do is to follow the scientific modern method of medicine. And they got rid of all the supposed quacks, all the pseudoscientists, basically everybody who didn't work for the Rockefellers and their foundations and didn't uh, sell their drugs was considered pseudoscientific quack. And so the chiropractics and the homeopaths and pretty much anybody who didn't sell the Rockefeller drugs was essentially persecuted. And many of those people were thrown in jail in the US. This is, th this is what made medicine of the 20th century. You know, this idea that modern medicine won because it cured all these amazing things that before we couldn't cure them. It's really not true. It won because of government fiat. Government fiat kicked out all the competitors. And if you competed, you were thrown to jail. And now, you know, for instance, I know a lot of people whose lives improved a lot from going to chiropractics. I, I haven't gone myself, but a lot of people get a lot of uh, improvement from it, which, you know, um, if they had not gone to the chiropractic, if they'd gone to a fiat doctor, there would have been two options. Take these, <laughs> take heroin, basically, is option one, and become a heroin addict and destroy your life. Uh, Oxycontin or whatever the latest thing your local uh, white coat dealer is giving you. So either they're going to put you on heroin or they're going to put you under life-threatening, life-altering, body-altering surgery that you probably don't need. And that's also going to require you to go on heroin afterwards and become a heroin addict. So, um, and many of those people just 
go to a chiropractic and feel much better immediately. Whereas the fiat doctor would have just, you know, um, the only options would have been extremely profitable to him and to the fiat medicine establishment. And, you know, arguably not very good for you. Yeah, it would have alleviated the pain, but, uh, you know, like the chiropractic just basically touches you uh, and fixes you. So, you know, I, I mean, I haven't had enough experience myself. I haven't researched it enough to be able to pass judgment. And of course, I'm not saying that all um, orthopedic doctors and everything that they do is nonsense. And I'm not saying that everything that chiropractics do is uh, legitimate. I'm saying uh, I believe that people should have the freedom to decide if they want to do this or that. And I think the only reason they don't have the freedom is not because chiropractics have proven to be exceptionally dangerous or because they have really, you know, killed millions of people like the pharmaceutical industry has. The only reason they don't uh, get to practice is because they stand in the way of the profits of the fiat medical establishment. And so everything that stands in that way, in the in their way, gets taken out. So it's it's a very complex story. It's very long, but the end result is that you have a monopoly on who can provide medical services, and you have a very strict set of guidelines and rules and drugs, and it all functions to the benefit of the companies that are in charge of this cartel, the medical cartel, and it's. Um, you know, very similar to the situation with uh, money and banking, very similar to universities, very similar to in, in, in fiat world. Basically, ultimately, again, since it isn't the consumer that is paying and uh, it isn't the consumer that decides who gets to stay in business, since the decision comes from above by fiat, you know, you are legitimate medicine, so you can give people heroin. You are illegitimate medicine, so you can't pe give people a massage and charge them money because that's pseudoscientific. You know, we're just going to stick to the tried and tested method of uh, sticking heroin in their veins um, as a way to manage back pain. That's why the medical industry looks like it is today. This is why it is such a giant scam. This is why medicine is so expensive in the 20th century when it was never really like this. You know, uh, at the end of the day, there's no reason medicine should be this expensive. It's so expensive because it's so fundamentally corrupt at every level, because at every level, people are protected from monopoly because of the emotional manipulation of the fiat uh, democratic system wherein you know oh no people are good. people can't afford to do this so therefore we need to give more money to the people who provide this so that they can give it at a lower cost and so let's subsidize them let's subsidize insurance let's subsidize medical uh, equipment let's subsidize uh, drugs and so all of those companies take those drugs and take the subsidies and uh, take the subsidies and then just keep raising their prices so things continue to get more and more expensive because there's no competition because it's all imposed from above because it's all by fiat and now people think it's normal that you know you you uh, break your ankle playing a game or whatever and then you go to the, uh, to a hospital and you have insurance and you still need to pay $60,000 it's i mean <laughs> why are they going to get you a new ankle from scratch what is sixty thousand dollars for you're gonna lie down in a bed for a bit and they're gonna cut you open maybe and uh, do something it's, there's no reason any of this stuff should be anywhere near as expensive as it is except that the fact that it's all monopolies all along the way and it's all done by fiat and that applies to the surgeries but of course i think the more egregious and most criminal part of the of the enterprise is the uh is the drugs the drug industry the, the legal drug industry that's the uh, real issue you know the, the 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 drug cartels the mexican drug cartels are amateurs next to the uh, next to the pharmaceutical companies who have networks of millions of dealers in white coats all over the world required by law to to to, to dispense this particular drug to people who show up with particular symptoms based on studies that were done by the company itself that stands to make billions from the drug and approved by people who were appointed in the FDA between their jobs at that company. It's the guy who used to be in the company. He goes into the FDA, he approves his own drug, and then he quits the FDA, goes back to his company and sells it. This is how it operates. They call it the revolving door. So. All of these drugs are imposed by fiat. They're massively profitable to those companies. 
And when it does turn out that, oops, uh, yeah, th- actually it turns out that um, giving heroin to people who have a headache may not have been the best idea. And we've um, created uh, tens of millions of heroin addicts worldwide. Whoops, let's pay a billion dollar fine to the government and to those people. I think, you know, a few thousand dollars for everybody who lost their mom or son or whatever. And doesn't matter. We continue to sell more heroin. This is the amazing thing. So now everybody, uh, you know, even in the mainstream, everybody says, oh, well, pharmaceutical companies are so corrupt that the opioid crisis, they did so many bad things. And, you know, in the New York Times, even they'll talk about this sort of thing, like even the normies, even the most NPC person, even the most trusting gullible person will accept the fact that the opioid crisis involved pharmaceutical companies doing bad things. But they still are somehow okay with the fact that the opioid crisis marches on and people are still being jacked up on opioid all over the world in insane quantities. And um, they give it away for free in emergency rooms. Basically, you just go and tell them I have um, anything wrong with me. And they, well, I shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> Don't want to give anybody any ideas. Uh, but... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, medicine is just, uh, to a very large extent, a heroin dealing racket at this point. Um, it's enormously profitable for the heroin dealers, but enormously destructive for the, uh, the addicts. So yeah, so to go back to your question, Dirk, yeah, I did have a lot more, but uh, <laughs> I had to finish the book at some point. In fact, you know what, let me dig up the early uh, draft of the book. Yeah, I also wanted, there was, there was also going to be a chapter on fiat war. The idea that, uh, you know, the way that uh, the U.S. government does war today, wherein, um, you know, a bunch of (laughs) Muppets uh, sit around and decide, oh, no, something happened somewhere in Afghanistan or Vietnam or Iraq or Cambodia or Panama or whatever. And now we, you know, a bunch of fat, uh, stupid dweebs sitting in Washington, D.C. need to fight. And then they just pass a law and then a bunch of fiat gets printed. And then a bunch of uh, essentially pleb children get um, shipped off to go kill Cambodians or Vietnamese and Iraqis. And of course, billions and trillions go to uh, um, military industrial complex companies. And so because if you just manage to convince the average uh, American politician uh, and the average American TV watching uh, uh, simpleton that, uh, oh no, bad things are happening in Iraq or Cambodia or Afghanistan, you can secure hundreds of billions of dollars for Lockheed Martin and so on. You know, again, because this money printer exists, because of this fiat thing, then all it needs is just a little bit of manipulation of public opinion. And then suddenly you've got um, a lot of idiots baying for blood. You know, oh no, we need to go and um, do things uh, to other countries and let's go and fight wars, you know? And of course, um, th- this isn't new. The US was doing this since World War II, pretty much all over the world. After World War II ended, the military industrial complex needed wars in order to justify it's the money because they were getting a lot of money in world war ii then world war ii ended they needed wars and this is the main driver of u.s foreign policy the idea that the u.s was going out there and fighting all of those wars for the good of the world i think is massively exaggerated it's just to um business to find business for the military industrial complex and currently you know enormous amounts of money are spent on uh, building enormous amounts of weapons that nobody really needs and um, at this point the you know if you look at the military industry this is this requires a little bit of research but if you look at the military industry you know there's there is an enormous number of in the us in particular there's an enormous amount of military projects that are getting commissioned to build weapons and equipment that is just an endless um, sewer swallowing money and producing nothing like the f-35 is one of the most prominent examples i'm not sure how many tens of billions of dollars have been spent on it and effectively it's pretty useless piece of shit uh, at this point um, militarily speaking it's been kind of obsolete 
um, and it never really worked very well, but it has made a lot of military contractors extremely rich. And of course, you know, it's killed a lot of people, but hey, who's counting? Let's see. Yeah, fiat chemistry, I mentioned that. Another one I thought about getting into, but this would have been a little bit more sophisticated, is fiat law. Um, the difference between legislation and law, uh, which is, I think, a very profound point. Law is natural order. Law is the natural ideas of justice that exist in every society. Don't take other people's stuff. Don't aggress against other people. And that's very simple and very basic stuff. And then legislation is basically... Um, it's a lot of uh, fiat people making things by fiat. You know, legislation says, oh, no, you can't drink this thing on this day and you can't smoke that thing and you should do that and you shouldn't do that. And you can only get treated by this doctor, but you can't get treated by that kind of doctor. Um, you know, the rise of the administrative state and the rise of the managerial state, this is fiat law. The idea that somebody at an organization um, you know, that, that is called the FDA can decide for me what chemicals I can inject uh, when I'm sick. You know, I'm not allowed to take this drug. So, so there are drugs out there that people might be willing to try. Pharmaceutical companies are developing them. People might be willing to try them. The FDA won't let you try it because it's not approved. You have to wait 10 years or so, during which time you'll, you, you might die or you'll likely die. So there are people that have like six months to live. And there's this drug that might allow them to stay alive, but they can't take it because the drug isn't approved because there's an FDA that says you can only take that if it's approved and they have to keep that process going. In my mind, if you had a free market, people who are desperate will try drugs and the fact that they will try them because they're desperate will give us a very good valuable insight into the effectiveness of those drugs. And uh, that's going to lead to much better process of learning about the effectiveness of drugs than having a monopoly um, regulator decide by fiat which drugs work and which drugs don't so you see this all across the managerial state you know with all kinds of things where you know a law is passed and suddenly you can't buy this thing from there and suddenly you have to build your house in a certain way and you can't import this thing and uh, the ability of these organizations to have uh, power continues to grow with time because they have essentially the fiat printer at their disposal and you don't. So we see the managerial state continue to grow that what people think of as the law today is essentially despotism is essentially somebody is is an endless list of tiny little tyrants um, taking charge of small parts of your life could have could have done a um, could have done another chapter on fiat art. There's still more to <laughs> there's more whips left in that dead horse. Um, and then there's, uh, um, there was also one that I wanted to, but this also kind of needed a lot more research, fiat reality, which is what modern psychiatry is. The fiat psychiatry is basically about trying to impose happiness by fiat. So, um, you're miserable. Why are you miserable? Well, I'm miserable because I'm doing bad things in my life, eating terribly, I'm in a bad relationships, um, I'm behaving in a terrible way. The normal way that humanity has always dealt with this is for you to try and think of what are, what are the things that are causing your problems, look at the deep causes, and then fix these. So why am I unhealthy? Well, it, maybe it's because of my habits, my, how I eat, my sleeping habits drinking too much, doing drugs, whatever it is. You know, this is this is how you would address a, a problem of a person who's having an unhealthy mental or physical state. You look at what are the causes that are bringing that about and you try and eliminate them. So stop eating garbage, start eating real food, start sleeping normal hours, um, work on those things, and then see the improvement that happens. Um, and then you can apply that sort of thing in psychological terms and in interpersonal relationships. So you're unhappy in your marriage, you're unhappy with your friends, uh, you're unhappy with your parents, whatever it is, you've got a problem. Again, you could s try and see where the cause of the problem is and then try and address it and figure out what the um, correct way to fix it is, is the way that people go about trying to improve their life. But the way that it's done with fiat medicine and fiat psychiatry is that you just take a pill. So this thing is giving you bad feelings, you know, your relationship with your husband or wife or um, 
children or parents or whatever is not working for you, it's dysfunctional, well, let's just leave everything as it is and give you a pill. And then the pill will make you happy and then uh, you'll forget about it. And the idea here, again, it's, it's exactly like the Keynesian t high time preference thinking, which is, oh, let's just print a bunch of money to get the economy going now. And then once the economy is going, then you know things will fix themselves. And then in the long run, there's not going to be a problem um, because you know the economy would have fixed itself. And similarly, this is the kind of idea with psychiatry. Like there is a reason that's making you miserable. What's miserable is let's say you have a, a dysfunctional marriage. And the reason for that dysfunctional marriage is let's say you're doing this, this, that, and that, and your spouse is doing those things. We could try and address those things, or we could just leave them as they are and give you both pills. And then you both will stop being so annoyed at each other, but you'll still be doing the things that are annoying each other, you know? So, uh, this is, of course, imposed by fiat. This is the standard of care. You, this is the only way that you can go in, and all other kinds of self-help are considered pseudoscientific. And so you go to somebody, they put you on a pill to try and escape reality. Mm -hmm. And the result of this is, you know, you don't confront the problems. So the problems get aggravated, which is, again, similar to the Keynesian issue. The reason we had a business cycle, the reason we have a recession is because of the previous round of Keynesian idiots who did something destructive to the economy that needs to be liquidated. They subsidized the business, a bunch of businesses that are not profitable. And they continue to operate even though they're not profitable and now their unprofitability is exposed. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is stop doing those stupid businesses and stop wasting resources on them and move on to something else. Well, if we just print a bunch of money, we don't have to make that painful adjustment and then we can just continue to aggravate the problem and then require an even bigger, more painful adjustment in the future. It's the same thing. And it's kind of how uh, um, I think, you know, modern medicine treats diseases as well. You know, oh, well, uh, you've got all of these horrible symptoms of this terrible disease. Here's a drug that fixes it. Don't worry about all the things that you're doing that are, are causing this. Don't listen to all of those uh, strange conspiracy theorists online who tell you that the things that you eat are uh, related to your health. Just take this pill and make our sponsors happy. Uh, <laughs> that's basically it. So, yeah. These were some of the uh, other fiat topics. And there's more. We could talk about so much more.